Good evening. Uh, welcome. My name is Rohan Shetty, uh, Vindhya, Vindhya Batch of 1986, and welcome to the first OL Nation Professional Knowledge, Thought Leadership, and Mentoring Networking uh, webinar. It's for OLs, by OLs, uh, presented by our official body, the OL Laurentian Association. Uh, I know it's been a bit of short notice, but we're very happy. We're very happy to be live with you right now. Uh, we have a great lineup of speakers. We've got uh, current affairs. We've, we are talking about the COVID-19 situation, which is number one in all our lives these days. Uh, for folks of us in the subcontinent, we are talking about the China syndrome, and of course, our Sterling Indian Defense Services. And last but not least, we've got Murad Lala, who is going to take us through his journey uh, from a specialist uh, surgeon. He's an oncologist, and he's decided he decided to put down his scalpel, test himself, and summit Mount Everest. Uh, I wish you. Uh, a good session, everybody. We've got a range of moderators who we have matched uh, with the speakers, and uh, we hope that they will be able to draw special, uh, you know, uh, good answers from our from our speakers. To get things moving, I will I will uh, now hand over to Johnny K. Paul, uh, Vindhya, 1970. Uh, sorry for the mistake on the flyer. I'm glad uh, many of you noticed it. Uh, Johnny, I, I hand over to you. Johnny, you have to unmute yourself. Johnny is the president of the OLA. Hi, everyone. You're good to go, a hearty welcome to all of you. And a big thank you for the overwhelming response to our last program conducted by the OLA, that is USOC. We have had over 8,000 views across all our social platforms. It was our only the second program that we conducted. Our first series of programs, the OL Assembly, has a social orientation. It's a variety entertainment and will be held on the second Saturday of every month. Today's program, the OL Nation, is different and will focus on personal development, which will include mentoring, networking, professions, education, entrepreneurship, and so on. It will be held on the fourth Saturday of every month. These events will be of interest to us, as well as families, friends, and the present students at school. It will be particularly useful to the younger OLs. The school is also looking for OLs to give talks to the students. To continue with these programs, we need the active participation of all OLs. Please do write to the OLA if you are interested. We are also looking forward to your suggestions for improvement. While the OL Assembly, organized by Arjun Rao, Batch of 19, Murthy, Batch of 84, today's event, the OL Nation, has been put together by Rin Shetty, Batch of 86, a big team of dedicated volunteers. I thank them all on behalf of the OLA. We, the committee, believe these events will unite, strengthen, and widen the fraternity, and we anticipate your wholehearted cooperation. Thank you. Johnny Paul, 1970, President of the OLA. I now invite the headmaster for his point of view. Good evening, everyone. Hope you can hear me. Hope you can hear me fine. Yeah. First of all, um, thank you very much, Rohan, for calling me and uh, giving me an opportunity to address. I could see uh, the lineup, the, the excellent lineup of eminent panelists. And in fact, I was uh, after looking at those entire list, I was thinking myself that this is an opportunity for me to listen and learn uh, from that collective knowledge of, of uh, people in different field. Uh, coming from the school side, School is right now going on a lockdown period. Students are not here. We also have opened up a system called Oil Knowledge Sharing Initiative. And uh, today we had uh, Mr. Sham Nair, 
uh, our, one of our old student, batch of 2002. He initially the program, the interactive program was um, scheduled for 45 minutes, but it was very interesting and it was very much appreciated by the students. And it went on uh, one or 15 minutes. And uh, we do have a lineup of uh, quite a few Yemen and oils next Saturday and also another two, three Saturday together. So uh, this COVID era has actually given us certain opportunity. Of course, this is a very difficult time, unprecedented time, but it is amazing to see how the oil society has converted this, um, this particular situation into an opportunity of learning, talking to each other and get together and all other professional um, area of uh, Delhi. And I'm very happy to be a part of it. And uh, of course, being headmaster, uh, it's my privilege to interact with all of you. And more than uh, being a headmaster, I'm headmaster to the present students, but I'll be a listener and uh, someone who is interested in learning a lot from such experienced people, uh, the galaxy of, uh, of, of uh, experts here. So I will sit quietly and listen to them. But definitely I'm going back to my students saying that, look, there is one more parallel line of information coming. The digital platform has evolved. Uh, it was there in the past also, but this particular situation has activated it. And uh, let us use it. Let us adapt, evolve, and let us use it fruitfully. And I personally feel this is also an opportunity. This also applied for me and also the present students uh, to learn a lot from the collective experience of uh, a series of uh, old Laurentians. Thank you. Thank you, Rohan. And thank you, Mr. Johnny Paul. Thank you, Mr. Prabhakar. And uh, if I'm not uh, mistaken, uh, you have a bunch of students and their parents also uh, tuning in this evening for this session. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay. okay, it'll be very nice. And um, you know, the OL, uh, the OL community and the OLA, uh, we have always been happy to give back to the school. And from myself and our larger team, point of view. This is a one way of contributing to everybody. Thank you very much. And our doors are always welcome. And do visit with COVID, without COVID, with founders, without founders, <laughs> doesn't make any difference. Please drop in okay. and be back. Oh, and here we have a COVID specialist, <laughs> Captain Arjun Nair. Uh, he's coming all prepared with his mask and fancy background. Uh, Sumeru 1975, Captain Arjun Nair is based in Chennai. He's an entrepreneur. Uh, from my industry, the maritime industry. He's going to, uh, he's my co-host, and he's going to uh, introduce you to these moderators during the course of this session. Over to you, Captain. Good evening, old family. I thought, uh, since we're into the COVID uh, uh, situation, I should come. Uh, and first topic is the front line of the COVID pandemic in India with uh, Rashid Dr. Farad Kapadia. I thought I'd introduce Dr. Rashid Kapadia to all of you. I must tell you, as also timekeeper for this event, we are doing very well. We are about two and a half minutes ahead of time. So we've got a little time to spare. And as soon as uh, Rashid comes on, uh, on the screen, I shall talk to you about Rashid Kapadia, who's passed out from Aravali 1977. Hello, Rashid. You're an old ex-mariner and a story of metamorphosis. While he started his profession as a marine engineer, today he has meta metamorphed into an evangelist for eloquence, public speaking, and storytelling. On the way, he educated himself both in India and the USA, gathering multiple degrees and certifications, including being a distinguished Toastmaster, a project manager, project management professional. In 2015, he was also an author. He published a book called Necessary Bridges, Public Speaking and Storytelling for Project Managers and Engineers. In between his engagements, he's committed to reading 50 nonfiction books a year. Can you believe that? And he's also attended a Vipassana course. Giving you Rashid Kapadia, someone we can all look up to. Well done, Rashid. And take it away from me and Please introduce your brother, Dr. Farad Kapadia, who should be on the screen anytime now. In the meantime, you must unmute yourself and be ready to speak to Farad. Thank you, Arjun. This is the first for me. 
for the first time in my life at the age of 60, I get to introduce my twin brother to a large audience as a subject matter expert. So after Farad finished his specialization in the United Kingdom, he returned to India with an expertise in intensive care medicine, in critical care medicine. And in the decades that followed, Farad has played a pioneering and leadership role in spreading this intensive care and critical care across India. I'll mention only two accomplishments here. 1991, first place, Diploma of Intensive Care Medicine across the European Union. Accomplishment number two, with a group of others, they co-founded an Indian Society of Critical Care Medicine, and now that has over 15,000, around 15,000 members. He was also a past president of that. Now, more details of his distinguished career can be seen on the social media posts that have been posted from yesterday. On a personal note, after I read Farad's book, I had these two thoughts. And the first one goes like this. Clearly, Farad has become like a Sherlock Holmes and I feel like Dr. Watson when I'm reading his book. The way he sees the world is far more scientific and accurate than I was seeing it. And I also remember this thought. It's a, mem it's a memory from our school days. Here in this book, the clear stream of reason has not lost its way into the dreary desert sand of dead habit of believing in tra tradition and not using evidence. Now, regarding his running, I'll just mention this. He's got many hobbies and he excels in them. I just marvel at the way he does it. He's finished running the full marathon about 15 times, including Berlin, Chicago, London, Mumbai, and New York. Now, he's told me that he wants to use all of his time uh, answering Q&A. So I've prepared a few Q&A and I'll, I'll start. Farad, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, what I'm going to do, Farad, is I've just divided the question, the groups into three groups. One is just general knowledge, one is best practices, and the last one is other. So I'll read out four questions from general knowledge and just mix them up and come up with an answer. One, how do pathogens spread in general? Why do some of them become pandemics? Why is this rare? And how does COVID spread? Over to you. Um, I think... Well, most people will have a pretty good idea of what's happening because we've had a new saturation about COVID, but uh, it's a virus and it spreads uh, by in the air, by people coughing it out. Uh, it's a droplet-borne infection or an airborne infection. And uh, the difference between a droplet-borne and an airborne infection is how small the particle is. This particle is very, very small. It can float all over the room and infect a lot of people. If the particle is pretty big, it just sort of falls in the, in the vicinity of a meter or two. So luckily, this is mostly a droplet infection rather than an airborne infection. Pathogens can spread through water, food, uh, mosquitoes, etc., but that's not really relevant to COVID. The thing about COVID, which is different from all other infections, is that most pathogens, whether they are viruses or bacteria, go in one direction. They become very efficient at spreading or they become very efficient at killing. Killing is not a great idea. At the time of the killing, the bacteria obviously or the virus finds a, a large food source, so to speak. But after the host dies, the bacteria or the virus loses their source of, uh, of uh, nutrition. Spreading is a much better way to, of doing things. So uh, a virus which can go from one person to the next through a cough and then go that, and induce a cough in the next person who then coughs and spreads to another five, 10 people can do a very, very good job of surviving. It's very rare very rare for a bacteria or a pathogen to get both at the same time, both these mutations. It's so rare that occurs once in 100 years or 200 years. And it's actually happened almost directly after 100 years that we've had something just spread across the continents. So the combination of a very good spreadability and a pretty good ability to kill is what has made this, uh, this pan pan pandemic uh, different from anything any of us will have seen or will see again. Yeah. That's it. Okay. Then let's go to best practices. Now, when you and I were practicing, you kept on and on and on coming back to the big three. So remind us, what are the big three that all of us should be doing all the time? Okay. Now, this is this this uh, advice or this this recommendations are again it's pretty widely known and it's it's applicable to non practitioners. This is if you're in a place where you may or may not be exposed to COVID. Okay. This is a fairly different. Uh, uh, set of practices if you are in a place which you know there is COVID. The, the level of care is different. 
So the big three are the most, the, absolutely the most important is the mask. Okay. And um, I'll just, I happen to have some masks here. So this is the sort of most basic one. It's a cloth mask. You can have one layer or two layers and it's really a social service. Should you be carrying COVID, your ability to spread it will decrease a lot by wearing the cloth mask. But if someone in the near vicinity has COVID, the cloth mask won't do a great job of protecting you. Okay. So the best option is obviously if everyone is wearing cloth masks, then you protect each other. However, if you're not so uh, altruistic and you're a little more selfish, you want to look after yourself, you use a surgical mask or a three-ply mask. It has three layers and it also repels the, uh, the pathogen. So in any situation where there's even a mild chance of you in a crowd or something, it is better to wear a surgical mask than a cloth mask. And finally, we have the N95 mask. They've got different names, but this filters up to 95%. And this is really when you're going into an area which is high likely to have COVID. And as far as I'm concerned, this is really for hospital staff and healthcare workers. Um, especially if there's a shortage, the general public should not be diverting this mask to the general public and denying the... Uh, so this is by far the biggest thing. The absolute number one is that you have to wear a mask. Of course, this is an airborne disease. The second thing is you should be sanitizing your hands regularly. And you can have a solution, something like this. Um, or you can use soap and water. And whether you wear gloves or not, every time you touch something, it's possible that someone had coughed on that surface. And therefore, it goes from your hands to your face and you inhale it and then, or you cough it out. So every time you're touching a new surface, you've touched coin, um, maybe money or whatever, please wash your hands. Again, doorknobs, anything which other people are touching and then you are touching. You need to have repeated hand washing, almost obsessive compulsive. And the third is probably not so important is to wear some sort of specs or maybe a set of goggles like this over, over and above. If you do these three, you've got your personal protection sorted out. But because this is a droplet infection, the most important thing is not to be close to people. So this three to six feet rule or one to two meter rule um, is a good idea. And obviously the more air circulation there is, or recirculation there is indoors, ACs, fans blowing things in different directions. You need to be much more careful. And the more outdoors you are, the thing will quickly disperse and dilute out and you don't have to worry about it. So physical distancing, masks, hand hygiene, plus minus goggles are things you should obsessively do uh, till such time as this pandemic has gone. Okay, thanks. Now, when we spoke a few Sundays ago, you told me about the way you have to go through the ICU. So my question to you is just walk us through one of your trips to and from a COVID ICU, highlighting all the safety precautions that you have to take. And also, it was new to me, just mention the way you cycle through masks, reusable masks. Okay, I'll do the reusable mask later. The reusable mask doesn't apply to a COVID area. Once you've gone, that gets thrown off. But should you use a mask in the public and you want to reuse it again, I'll come to that later, just remind me. So what I know is to get into hospital scrubs. That's the first thing. From there, you go down to the COVID area and there's an area outside, which is called the clean area. It's called the donning area. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. So in the donning area, you have to be extremely thorough. This is the time to be obsessive compulsive. And to, even though I've done it lots of times, there is a checklist and you keep going through the checklist with your eyes on the checklist. And uh, without getting too boring, you first put on a, a set of shoe covers, then you put a cap cover, then you put a first mask on, then you put a second mask on, then you put a plastic apron on, and then you either put a gown like this on in a relatively low risk or moderate risk area, or you put a hazmat on, which is like a spacesuit in a high risk area or a positive area. And then you put goggles on, and then you put a second pair of gloves on. Um, the whole, this is a little complicated, but this is the sort of technique you do before you go in. You're still in a clean area. Once you go into that dirty area or the contaminated area, you don't get to come out because you could transmit the virus outside. Then basically, so what I first do is I go to the suspect area. The suspect area is where people might have COVID, but it's not yet proven. And so you don't want to take COVID from the COVID ward to the suspect area. So you always start with the suspect area. Then you basically see every patient. You've got to do a lot of things. I won't get into the technical details. Some are stable and you talk to them. Some are on life support and they, you can't speak to them. And you know they are sedated and paralyzed on breathing machines and dialysis machines and so on. 
after you finish that you make a plan for the day you make sure that all the doctors all the nurses all the technicians know the plan for the day then you speak to the family then you go to the next patient the next patient next patient next patient and sort of i am as of currently i'm looking after for two icus and 14 patients so so that would be my at the end of the day at the end of the round how you get out is exceedingly important it's probably much more important than how you get in because this is the time you can contaminate yourself so once again there's a checklist and the key thing here is once you take your outer gloves off you've got clean inner gloves so you can't allow that to get contaminated so anyway there's a certain way of only touching the inside of your clothes and not the outside of your clothes and one by one you sort of take out all those layers except the last two the gloves and the mask you don't want to take out when you're in the area because you could then breathe the virus in or you could touch something so you just go immediately out and discard the gloves and the mask then you put on another surgical mask like the one i'm wearing and then you go back and change into your then you go to another floor then you change back into your whatever your regular clothes and then off back to the main hospital so it's a bit of an obsessive compulsive thing and uh, it's i am senior so i get to i just spend two or three hours in the icu but for people who are doing six hours it's the maximum you can do you start feeling light headed and so on and nurses who are doing eight hours have to take a break at the end of four hours oh i'm glad you love your job so much uh you got to mention the way you cycle through the masks yeah see a mask like this if i happen to wear it in a clean area and i have five masks i can just put a date on so let's imagine this got contaminated by a virus let's imagine the virus doesn't last more than 3 to 5 days 3 to 4 days so if i have a set of five masks and i you wear one today and then one tomorrow and one day after etc by the time i get back to this mask the virus is dead so you it's better to keep it in a bag like this so put it in the bag like this so that it's not contaminating anything and remember we always touch the inside once you use it you don't touch the outside if you put it in and that's the way you recycle masks so there'll be a name and a date oh i i i still have to force myself to do this but I, i'll succeed okay thanks now i'm also interested in a more pragmatic eventually we all have to come back to normal and you told me how you and your runners group decided to start running again so why don't you walk us through the thinking and the best practices that you all followed before starting um again it really comes down to the big 3 uh, we obviously couldn't run when there was a lockdown once the lockdown opened they allowed you to run on the road but group running is still not allowed so for a run you you at least in bombay the rule is you have to wear a mask so option of not wearing a mask is really not there uh having said that running with a mask is difficult and running with the n95 mask is dangerous okay there have been lung injuries and this that and other so when you start in the beginning if you meet people please be 3 to 6 feet away from them with the mask up once you start running make sure your most people anyway run mostly on their own and if you're chatting with someone be uh, sort of far enough away that uh, you know your your air doesn't mix or you breathe and that time you can put the mask down over your chin and as soon as you sort of get close to someone you put the mask back up like that so mask up when you're with someone and mask down when you're running and then the mask up at the end of the run get into the car go home etc with the mask up okay cool i just noticed you're only handling the mask from inside i never caught this before so something else for me to pick up thanks a lot for that okay i want to move on to the category called other so, you know human beings are basically quite irrational many times so comment on the confounding aspects of politics of ignorance of conspiracy theories of financial interests and what would you as a doctor like us to be responsible how can we manage ourselves responsibility to support the community um you know it's it's not that politicians are irrational or anything it, each person is uh, pursuing their own selfish interest and they will choose a path which works well for them it's a little idealistic to assume that you know people will give up their jobs for the greater good and all that that doesn't happen in the real world so you ultimately have to make up your own mind and i, I mean there's no real advice i can give except uh, trust even if you trust verify for yourself and you know this is a non medical audience there is a certain way of verifying information and you really do need to use the the tried and the tested uh, and not go by the the whatsapps and the newspaper articles and the youtubes and the ted, TED talks and those kind of stuff um okay but it's time to go ahead unfortunately in the pandemic the thoroughness of research has been compromised a bit it just it has to be you can't really there's no point getting perfect research at the end of the pandemic so there's been a fair amount of uh, recalibration again and again and again but rashid it's not complicated yeah. 
Okay, fire is time for Q&A. Arjun, I'm standing by, the chat box is open. Looking forward to any questions. I've got a few on standby. So I'll wait for a few more seconds. And if I, okay, let's see, I'll go to the Q&A as well. Hi, Farad, this is brilliant. I have a question on swimming. Even if swimming pools are open, will it be safe to swim? The nature of this pandemic is like most common answer is going to be, I don't know. Um, I think it should be okay as long as there is um, physical distancing. But keep in mind, swimming is what we call aerosol generating. You're breathing, you're hitting water, there's a lot of splashing, etc. So I think swimming alone in a pool, I think should be fine. But I don't even know if the six meter, uh, two six feet rule is there or you need more than that in the swimming. Um, so I would be a little wary about it. Again, uh, if there's an open air pool, you're probably better off. If it's closed and there's air circulating, you need to be a little careful. Okay, thanks. Uh, that question is from Senti. Thank you, Senti. This one is from Nita Joshi, our batchmate, the greatest batch that ever went through Lovedale, 77. What does the future look like in regards to COVID? Um, Hi, Nita. How oh, nice to hear, you, uh, hear it through the chat. Uh, there's a saying it's dangerous to predict things, especially the future. And I think any, any uh, attempt at predicting COVID is a little foolhardy. Um, when I first took part in this, and the, the lockdown was three to six weeks, it was clear to me it could take longer than that. A month or two down the line, I sort of wrote off 2020. It's beginning to dawn on me that it's time to probably write off 2021. I cannot see things moving in a, in a free way till then. We'll still have to distance, we'll still have to. But reality changes very fast. So I think it's good to just look a month or two ahead. In a month or two ahead, there's no way we are going to have to be casual. We are going to have to be. And as the, as the reality changes, we will uh, change our approach. But I think if you're a betting person, bet for a long pandemic, not a short one. Oh, thanks for the good news. Anyway, another question. How safe is flying at this time? This is also from Nita. Is the problem is circulating air. Um, and wearing an N95 mask, I, I didn't uh, sort of specify, it becomes harder as more and more time goes by. So uh, doing an eight-hour flight with the N95 mask is exceedingly difficult. You can't, when you eat or you drink, uh, the N95 mask is out. Now, planes do have HEPA filters, so they do filter stuff out, and there's going to be distancing. But I would say that um, fly if you, if you know it's important for your family or your career or your whatever, but uh, just, just a fun flight or a social flight probably put off for now. Um, if you're going to use an N95 mask, try to keep it on as long as possible. It is, it's definitely hard. Okay, after three to four hours, your head starts feeling lightheaded, your oxygen levels fall, your carbon dioxide goes up. It's not fun. Okay, for is okay. Uh, sorry, time for only one more question. I'm going to read this out. Hi, I'm Adil Gandhi. I'm 75 years plus and I've been in lockdown since three months. My family is totally against me going out. Continued spikes of COVID in the city. I'm frustrated staying home. So my question to you is this. Can I be careful and go out keeping strict social distancing in mind and also wearing a mask? The percentage of recovery is pretty high. So keeping in mind my age and having no real health issues except for this and that, uh, which is in control, what are the dangers or rather chances of recovery, just in case I get it? Long question. Go uh, for it. Last one. First, Adil, I think you can definitely go out as long as you sort of keep a social distance and wear a mask. There's no question. Going out is actually therapeutic. And I think being locked in for a long time has its own set of problems. Being physically active is therapeutic uh, in, a, in a medical way, not in a sort of mental way, that everything is better. So you, you, you should be doing that. The main thing is, um, uh, is keeping a physical distance. And with friends, it becomes a little awkward to tell people to stay away. So you still have to be a little strict about that. Pro probably the best thing to do is go out by yourself in the beginning. Um, now, if you fall sick, you know what? It's, it's a hit and miss. Here. I mean, there's no doubt that uh, um, young people are having a very mild disease. But middle-aged people and, I don't know, I, no one thinks they're elderly. But uh, as you cross sort of 50, 55, 60, 65, you, the risk is definitely more. To a large extent, how, what a heavy load of virus you are, uh, 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 you, are, you are exposed to is probably the biggest risk factor. With a very mild viral load, you'll have a mild illness. But if someone coughs into your face or five people cough into your face, you're sitting in a place with a lot of circulating area, you can have a very, very nasty illness. So I think if you, 
for the best advice for if you're going to start just start in with a solo with a mask and open areas and you should be fine if you can use a lift rather than stairs you'll be fine okay farad i think we're out of time arjun thank you very much farad that was as usual it's like by the way i get a i have a conversation like this almost every sunday so i'm really taking my job to be responsible i encourage you to do the same arjun that thanks again farad arjun back to you Arjun, you have to unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you for reminding me to unmute myself. I normally do that reminder for others. But nonetheless, thank you. That was a very interesting talk with uh, your brother, uh, Dr. Farad, and it was nice to see the twins together on screen at one time. Now, staying with current programs and current situations in in the world today, we now switch to the China syndrome and the Indian Defence Services, wherein we have the moderator. Lieutenant Colonel R S Gill of Vicky Gill of Sumeru, 1984. Now, as a proud Sumerian and a Fauji brat, I'm delighted to introduce the next session of the two Sumerians from the Indian Army. We are talking about him as he enters the screen. An infantry man, Colonel Gill. He is from the 73rd course of the prestigious National Defence Academy. He was commissioned in the famous Second Battalion of the Guards. In December 1988, during the 20 years of service to the nation, and before he took premature retirement in 2009, he served on the Siachen Glacier as a volunteer. He commanded the Bana Post, which is the world's highest military post that is manned throughout the year. He has served in counterinsurgency operations in 1993 in the famous Pulwama we know so well about, for which he was decorated. Colonel Gill is currently settled in Kutch in Gujarat, and having known Major General Singh in school as a senior, is probably the right person to be in conversation. Also, being an infantryman, he'd be great to be in conversation with the general. Here is all yours, Colonel uh, Vicky Gill. We, while we wait for uh, General Singh to come online, we're happy to have you here with us. I hope you are happy to be here with us. I sure am, uh, Arjun. Thanks a lot for that uh, intro. Um, firstly, I would like to thank Rohan and his team for organizing OL Nation and giving OLs an opportunity to interact on this forum. Um, it is my uh, singular honor to interact with uh, General Vikram Singh, for whom I have a profound regard, going back to school days. Uh, we were both in Sumeru House, where he and uh, Admiral Philippos were prefects when we were in the ninth class back in 1981. He was commissioned into his father's battalion, that is the uh, 17 Grenadiers, which is also the regiment I was commissioned in. That is the first battalion, Indian Grenadiers, now designated second battalion, Brigade of the Guards. Uh, while uh, most of you would have uh, read General Vikram's bio on the OL Nation page, I take this opportunity to highlight some uh, very interesting facts about his family. Uh, General Vikram Singh belongs to one of the most illustrious military families in India, past and present. Uh, his great grandfather fought in the First World War, his grandfather in the Second World War, and his father in the 1971 India-Pakistan War. Uh, in what may be the only instance of its kind, all three of these gentlemen were taken prisoners by the enemy after hard-fought battles. Brigadier Hamir Singh Ji was the only surviving company commander after an epic and bloody battle which was fought against the Pakistanis in Poonch in the 1971 war. He was a prisoner of the Pakistan Army for one whole year before being repatriated and was awarded the Veer Chakra, which is one of India's highest gallantry awards. In the present, uh, General Vikram and his younger brother, General Vijay Singh, Sumeru, 1983, carry on this fine family tradition with both having commanded two of India's finest frontline divisions, the 15th Infantry Division and the 33 Armour Divisions. Uh, General Vikram, uh, I'm sure my batch and all OILs join me in conveying a deep gratitude to you and your family for your service to this nation. Uh, yes. and we truly reflects the never given uh, spirit. Um, I'll just clarify that this uh, interaction is purely military in nature and uh, politics is not in our scope. And uh, we will not be entertaining any questions of a political nature. 
uh, the views expressed by General Vikram Singh are his own private views and do not reflect the views of the Indian Army in any manner. So, uh, Bull, let's uh, get on uh, to the business at hand. Uh, of late, this uh, Indo-China problems cropped up again, and uh, I've just framed certain questions, uh, keeping in mind uh, the kind of questions which I'm getting from uh, my friends, civilians, all the time on the city street. So firstly, uh, you see, uh, India shares approximately a 4,000 kilometer border with China, and uh, this is uh, across three main sectors. Uh, could you just elaborate on uh, you know, the peculiarities in each of these sectors, and uh, how do you view it? Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's great to be on. And uh, Rohan, thanks a lot. Uh, I'll just reiterate what uh, Gil has said. These views which I'm sharing are purely mine. They do not in any way, uh, I do not reflect the government or the Indian Army views. Uh, but I'm only sharing my own views. And I would uh, keep uh, to the military aspect of the issue at hand. So I'm just going to share a screen with you about uh, this first question that Gil has asked me. It talks about <clears throat> okay. Uh, if you can see the uh, uh, map on the screen, you find that the entire border that we have, right from uh, the Aksai chain area and going on to uh, the Himachal Pradesh, Uttarakhand, coming to Sikkim and uh, Arunachal Pradesh that is skirting Bhutan, the entire area is a disputed area. Uh, now, it is called the line of actual control. Uh, it, there's a difference between line of actual control and the uh, line of control and the IB. Now, IBs are internationally acknowledged, uh, marked on the ground borders between two countries. Uh, line of control is what we share with uh, Pakistan, wherein it is an agreed boundary which has been marked on the ground and is visible by way of markers and indicators which clearly dictate the sites, uh, which side is Pakistan, which side is uh, India. As far as China is concerned, we have a line of actual control. Now, this is a line which is actually not marked on ground. Uh, we have a claim in a particular area. Chinese have a counterclaim in a particular area, and these two claims don't match. Just to give you uh, a sort of an indication, you find all these areas that I have marked in uh, yellow and blue are all the areas where we have major confrontation with the Chinese. Now, why this has happened is you will look at, uh, I'll take you to this map, which very, very simply, uh, simplistically tells you what it is. Uh, now, uh, if you see, this is uh, the uh, line, that dotted line that you're seeing here. This is the uh, boundary as uh, India claims it based on the uh, Johnson line of 1865. What you see in red is what is the India's claim of the LAC. That is the line of actual control. And this is at, as it was in 1959 when these uh, discussions were taken. And these were the lines. This was the area that we claimed as our uh, line of actual control. Whereas, uh, if you see this blue line is the one where the Chinese came till in 1962 and further after the operations, they reached this dotted line. And this is what they claim as the line of actual control. So now you see the difference in perception. We say this is the, the red line is the LAC. They say this is the LAC. Now, this is what is the main cause of concern. And that is why you have an issue as to what to uh, who who's correct, who's not. There have been 22 border meetings and more between uh, both the countries. We still have uh, not reached any uh, conclusion. Now, is China willing to reach a conclusion is a point of uh, great uh, uh, thing that whether are they really looking for a solution at this moment? That's a different topic altogether. We can discuss it sometime later. So in my view, they are not looking for any solution to the LAC as of now because they have got their own reasons. Yeah, Gil. Okay, uh, so Bull, um, uh, we can see the two claims, uh, both the sites very clearly in these uh, slides which you have shown us. Uh, you know, historically, uh, this is the uh, Eastern Ladakh uh, area uh, bordering uh, uh, Tibet on this side. 
but historically we've had a problem in uh, arunachal as well and also could you tell us really what are the chinese after uh, in arunachal and what are they after in uh, um, eastern ladakh okay fine uh, see uh, i'll get back to this map again uh, just to keep uh, get it easy to understand now uh, when we say eastern ladakh we are talking of this area which is also known as the aksai chin this is the area that we are talking of uh, now and this is the area of arunachal pradesh that we are talking of now uh, as far as aksai chin is con uh, is concerned uh, you would find uh, some of you must have read up china after uh, having got aksai chin under control from pakistan have constructed a major road called the g219 which connects their xinjiang region this is the eastern uh, uh, china region which connects uh, to the uh, to tibet by this one road which goes through the aksai chin and xinjiang is a major area of concern for them because of the uighur muslims and the uh, fight that they are having with the chinese over there so uh, the Uh, the chinese believe that if if this area access is given to if uh, this area is ceded to india then india can interfere with its activities here in xinjiang and also its own connectivity with xinjiang will get uh, compromised when you come down to uh, arunachal pradesh you see where after they annexed nepal which we uh, accepted and uh, subsequently dalai lama escaped from there now uh, as we all know the lai lama was born in arunachal pradesh and that is one of the main reasons and the monastery of tawang which is an old monastery uh, to buddhist monastery based on these uh, features and saying that the uh, chinese call it as the southern tibet and that is the part that uh, they say ki this is uh, southern tibet and because of the dalai lama being from there and the uh, monastery being there as a proof this this uh, area was a part of tibet called southern tibet and therefore they claim almost the entire part of arunachal pradesh okay so um, uh, in the east uh, uh, what's happening is that because of uh, the sam rifle the uh, uh, and uh, regular patrolling uh, which takes place between both the sides uh, it's a much more kind of a settled uh, the frontier compared to uh, exciton uh, but now since uh, bull this uh, entire uh, shamozal is taking place uh, along you know the galwan valley we heard of uh, pagongso and uh, so you know one gets a, a view that um, though we might have a very very long border with uh, china and it is disputed all along the border but uh, you know if you really think of it uh, the present disturbance which is taking place is uh, confined to a relatively very narrow uh, stretch of the lse and uh, if you see from uh, door book what you've written is demchok till the khardungla so uh, given you know a kind of a restricted theater where we are uh, now facing the chinese uh, can you just uh, tell us um, how exactly is the indian army placed uh, to take on the chinese uh, in this particular area okay uh, uh, what i'm going to do is uh, i'll use another map here now just to give you an idea as to which area we are talking about we are talking about this area this is the galwan valley which is at the edge of the aksai chin and actually based on the lac as perceived by china now this is what you need to understand this is what the kind of territory it is you see this is the uh, galwan river coming down and this is the siok these heights are way about 17 18000 feet you see the kind of heights that exist this red line is what is being called as the uh, which is uh, the uh, agreed lac or not agreed which is which uh, china claims as the lac so chinese till uh, hither to four were actually coming up to this point patrolling and going back indians used to come to this a uh, point patrol and go back there were no fixed uh, posts there were these were these were unwritten understanding as uh, the number of uh, the, the agreements that have taken place between the two countries forbade any construction or any occupation of area between the two perceived lines of the lac and therefore uh, 
patrolling was permitted, we would go to our perceived line of the LAC, they would come to our side of the LAC. Now, what actually happened? Now, this is what I'm trying to tell you in a very, uh, it's diagrammatic, uh, sorry. So, uh, if this is Aksai Chin area, when I was saying that this is the, our line of perception as far as uh, LAC is concerned, this is the Chinese line of perception as LAC is concerned. What used to happen, we used to go up to our area of uh, understanding and come back. They used to come to their area and go back. But what they did this time was they camped in the middle in the no man's land or the area which was disputed. Now this is, as a counter, India also put up their tents because we didn't want them to go any further. So on the day of uh, when this clash took place, actually it happened at this point called PP14. This is the place, is a dominating point. Now the importance of this point is that from here, there is a strategic road which is connecting uh, eastern part of Ladakh with another part of Ladakh along the border, which is a sort of a shortcut reaching there. This road comes under direct observation from this point. So any uh, post occupied by uh, the enemy can put this entire road under observation and therefore we objected to their pitching up a post over here and that's where the clash took place. We asked them to move, they didn't move, there was, uh, there was some uh, altercation which led to whatever you've all read. So this is the reason why this point happened and why now uh, the reason why they don't want us to come beyond, sorry, uh, come beyond this area and further towards our perceived line of LAC is purely because of this road which is there and they don't want us to reach any point close to this G219 road that they've created and they want to keep us as far as away from there because if this road is interdicted then their connectivity to uh, eastern uh, China that is Xinjiang province gets uh, affected. So that is basically what the whole event was all about. Okay, uh, uh, thanks for that, Bull. And uh, 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 I think we would just uh, uh, better to uh, go on to the question and answers uh, now. And um, uh, uh, Rajneesh Thal, uh, he wants to know that if there are two different claims, you know, there's an Indian claim on the LSE and the Chinese claim, so those two different uh, claim lines. Is it not best to take this to an international arbiter like the United Nations? And has this been tried at any point? See, both countries are calling it a bilateral issue. And they are not, uh, they are not wanting to go for any arbitration like what we have uh, with uh, Pakistan. We don't uh, ask for arbitration. Neither do we do it on this side. The point is that every time they get together, there's a great bonhomie, there's a great uh, way ahead and a lot, I, I don't have the time. Otherwise, if you go through the, uh, the uh, understandings or the actions that they propose to take in all these meetings, it's very, uh, very heartening. But on ground, it doesn't happen. Now, uh, you need to understand that uh, why it doesn't happen is because uh, if you see the entire borders of China, there's only one place which the borders are not settled and that is with India. I mean, if a country wanted to settle these borders for the last so many years, it should have been done. So obviously, they're not looking forward to uh, keep uh, for this uh, settlement to take place because, of, after all, in my perception, they look at India as a competitor at the, in the southern, in the Asian powerhouse. So, and that's why they want to prove to the world, that despite all the nuclear arms, etc., that India has, it still has a problem safeguarding its own borders. So, how can you consider it as a uh, regional power. So, you know, this, this, in my understanding, this uh, settlement is not going to come in a hurry. Okay, uh, I'll just add to that, uh, taking the situation to the United Nations uh, is not always the solution because as you know, what's happened between us and Pakistan, because you may have a resolution uh, passed by the United Nations, but a lot then devolves on the political uh, 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 scenario in the two countries because in spite of having a UN resolution between India and Pakistan on uh, Pakistan occupied Azad Kashmir whatever you call it still uh, it so happened that uh, China has been able to uh, construct the CPEC the China Pakistan economic corridor going through Gilgit Pakistan uh, Gilgit Baltistan 
uh, which is uh, in Pakistan occupied Kashmir that belongs to India as per India's perception and also as per the United Nations mandate, which says that the area is to be uh, uh, considered after Pakistan withdraws from the area which it was it had occupied illegally after 1947 operations. So it's a very nuanced and a very, very uh, kind of a complex issue. And uh, the moment we say that we are going to the United Nations, we ex uh, you know, accept a third party mediation, which somewhere politically is perceived to be weakening our position. So uh, do we have uh, uh, any more time for questions? Because uh, uh, Rahul Majumdar wants to know that, uh, uh, Bull, if you could just uh, clarify this. Uh, are we in a state uh, or do we have the wherewithal uh, or equipment systems uh, to kind of take on the Chinese in these areas? Okay, uh, I'll just make two, three quick points which should cover a lot of questions which might be coming up. Uh, is the Indian Army prepared? Indian Army couldn't be more, uh, any better prepared than what it is today. If you look at the Chinese Army, they have not fought a war after Vietnam in which they lost very badly. Secondly, they have never fought war at such an altitude. They have never, they don't have posts at such an altitude. They have not operated in such an altitude. Indian Army on its, uh, on its hand, its entire infantry uh, corps, the entire infantry, every one, at least three times or four times their service have served in this area and actually occupied posts and operated in this area. So we are more than physically fit and able. Equipment-wise, we are as good or as bad as any other army. Yes, uh, there are uh, needs, but they will be met should uh, the push come to shove. So uh, as, as an army, we are well and more uh, than uh, required prepared to take on the Chinese army. See, I've seen a lot of people discussing that, oh, China is such a big army and uh, our Indian army is such a small army. You know, it's not, it's not that. It's not that the entire... PLA is going to come into India. I mean, he's got borders to worry about. He's got Russia to worry about. He's got the Russia. Uh, he's got Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan. He's got the uh, Koreas. He's got uh, the uh, Taiwan. He's got he's got enough problems of his own on his own side. So his entire army cannot move over here. Secondly, a lot of uh, 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 all inspiring uh, videos that they are uh, showing that we can do this and we can do that. All those videos are the, are in the Tibetan plateau. None of them are of the in, in the area where Aksai Chin is or in those altitudes. And secondly, I, those of my generation, if you remember, Enter the Dragon when uh, O'Hara tries to uh, scare Bruce Lee with break, breaking that board and uh, with his fist, Bruce Lee simply says, boards don't hit back. So uh, they have never fought a war. We are at war every day, whether it's in JNK, whether it's at the glacier, in those altitudes, whether it's in Arnachal, our guys are operating on that altitude every day. So be rest assured, we are more than adequately prepared and equipped for such a confrontation and we will take it on. There is absolutely nothing to worry about. Okay, Bull, it's uh, so heartening to see. There are uh, so many questions which are uh, still coming uh, from uh, Ranjit Gokran and Kinshuk Das. Uh, yes, we see your questions, uh, but just uh, because of the paucity of time and uh, the overall planning of this uh, webinar, uh, I just say that I'm sorry we can't take this on, but uh, that's a point for uh, Rohan. That, uh, I think, uh, Gil, you can take, uh, I think you can take, uh, you've you got just over a minute to go, I think you can, you can take a question or two. Okay, so I'll just, uh, uh, Bull, uh, a question which uh, is on a lot of people's mind. Uh, it's a, uh, do you see a prospect of a full-blown uh, war with the Chinese at this time? No, absolutely not. Because, uh, you see, going to war is a major decision, which even China has to think twice before it's taking. And uh, it has a problem of its own. Uh, it thought the way the situation went in this Galwan Valley or uh, when they tried to do something in, in Doklam sometimes back, they didn't expect the kind of reaction that the army gave. So they are not really very confident of going into war and they might show that we are massing troops at the border. So are we, we've got adequate troops deployed there. I don't think any war is coming by uh, in a hurry. Uh, there's nothing on, uh, on those cards that I think of. There may be skirmishes, there may be border skirmishes, war all out, definitely no. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Uh, that was um, very educative and um, 
just for the paucity of time and because of the overall this thing and i know a lot of people want to uh, ask a lot of questions and uh, they really get an opportunity like this to directly interact with the uh, serving uh, divisional commander of the indian army uh, so uh, i'll thank you full thanks a lot and uh, thanks everyone back to uh, arjun all right thanks i think that was a wonderful talk and and since we're doing all current topics there's a lot of questions in everybody's mind about covid especially about india indo and china in amidst the covid and i think you've handled it really well uh, colonel gill you've done a great job of probing into uh, by by sending probing questions across to general and uh, you've explained it so well and reassured most of us i think all the doubts uh, are more or less uh, sorted out in many minds where you talked about the pla not getting the entire army down here or whether we are very well off in equipment or high altitude warfare and thank you very much a great uh, session and i think most people would enjoyed it and i we would like to have a lot more time however as a time keeper i'm sorry i can't give you that because we have to uh, uh, go go with the flow thanks very much and we are on for the last session the the last session is going to be uh scalpel to summit a twist with everest and i'm waiting for professor adrian kennedy to come on the screen i'm uh, i can see messages coming in from all around saying thank you for a lovely session ah good evening sir where is he he just disappeared anyway let me let me talk to you about professor adrian kennedy while he comes along he's ex aravalli 1965 and why currently the chief wellness officer at arabian wellness and lifestyle management in dubai he has studied business law and health he even has a phd while he was an accomplished athlete in school in both the 100 meters and 200 meters he went on to represent india at the asian level an example of never giving in or giving up he continued to excel in many fields he has been the director of apollo hospitals education and research foundation is a faculty for the harvard medical school and apart from being a specialist in lifestyle medicine today he patents he is an author of a book fitness a way of life and has contributed over 100 articles published across newspapers journals and magazines that's not all he swam the english channel and believe it or not my god he's also a black belt holder in karate while believer in the never given spirit crossing new horizons and taking up different challenges and excelling in what he does no doubt he's had hurdles to cross and several nadirs on his journey but that can be saved for another time when we put the honorable professor into the box to interview him now if i were to list his achievements and awards i would run i would be questioned on time usage so let me hand over to the accomplished professor kennedy and ask him to probe dr murad lala's mind and get on with the last session thank you very much thank you arjun ah uh... I was uh, I was uh, introduced to Murad about three weeks back, and it was perhaps one of the best introductions I've had. Now Murad claims to be an ordinary person with extraordinary dreams, but what I noticed most about Murad is that he makes his dreams come true. He lives his dreams. you could travel back to when murad was in school he was an avid uh, he was an avid participant in the ncc he went on to get the prime minister's gold medal in the air wing and represented india uh, in the ncc in the ncc jamboree in singapore uh, of course his interest in flying started there and he went on as only murad can do to get his private pilot's license and since that was not exciting enough he took to skydiving and other such aerial acrobats now from around 2007 to 2009 
he was introduced to the Himalayas perhaps for the first time, but he did this in a motor car. And he did the Himalayan rally for about three years and ended up being amongst the awardees. Now, uh, he probably didn't find uh, driving a car fatiguing enough. And therefore, Murad went on to cycle 1,400 kilometers across Iceland. The pinnacle of his achievements, an app word to use, was uh, the, the 19th of May, 2019, when Murad summited Everest. When I asked Murad, why do you do these things? Why don't you simply walk the paved road like the rest of us? And he said, Professor, neither flowers nor people flourish and blossom on a paved road. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, that is Murad a 20 years practicing surgeon in oncology. I've asked Marab to kindly, if he could, take us up to Everest. And he said he would through a video program that he's put together for us. So though we had at Laurentians, Murad Lala, Aravali, 1981, perhaps the only Laurentian and certainly the only civilian doctor to have summited Everest. Murad, show us something, please. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Adrian, for those glowing, for that glowing introduction. And it's indeed an honor to be part of this uh, first session of the OL Nation and even a greater honor to be introduced by someone uh, as much as he has achieved, Professor Adrian. Professor Adrian, as was just very briefly mentioned in, in the introduction, is, has represented India and was the national champion, not just in track and field events, but also in karate. And believe it or not, he represented India in rugby as well, if I get that right. Thank you. Yeah. So now, uh, through the next few minutes, I, while I share the screen, I am going to take you through my journey from the plains of Mumbai to the summit of Mount Everest. And believe me, every single day was a never given moment. And I'm not just saying that because I'm on the old group. Climbing a mountain is different from other sports. The only opponents that you face are the demons that play in your mind. The only goals that you can score are the limits that you set for yourself, whether it be the summit or anywhere else in between. There are no spectators to cheer you on, so many a times it's a lonely battle of your mind versus the elements. So what is the aura? What is the romance associated with this mountain? We all know it's the tallest point on earth and it's the longest duration. It's not like another mountain where you go to the base and you keep climbing and climbing until you reach the top. If you try that on Mount Everest, you'd neither reach the top nor will you get down. And many days it's a long waiting moment to continue your climb. Now Mount Everest coming in at 29,000 feet, it comes within the jet streams. These jet streams are extremely strong winds with velocities of approximately 150 to 200 kilometers an hour that rage across the summit at 29,000 feet. And it's just a few days every year that these jet streams move higher up and northwards towards China. That's the time you have to make your summit push, reach the summit and get back down before the jet streams come back. It is risky. Accidents and deaths are a reality on this mountain. Now coming back to the summit window, a few years ago, there was a headlining a photograph in all the papers saying Mount Everest, the world's highest traffic jam. 
you can see this huge queue of people. Now that is because in that particular year, the actual summit window was just three days. So everyone had to be at that point to summit within those three days, or they would have lost the chance to summit Mount Everest in that particular year. And the rest of the time, there's no one on the mountain. So actually it's quite misleading. It's not really the world's highest traffic jam. Now, when I decided to summit Mount Everest, I had a slight problem. I had no formal mountaineering experience prior to this. Uh, probably the real mountain I had probably climbed up until then was Dodabetta Dota, Dota Peak while I was in Lawrence School. And I went to the Himalayan Mountaineering Federation and requested them that I want to do the basic and the advanced mountaineering courses. But they said, you're too old. The cutoff is 40 years and I was going to be 50 years that year. So they did not enroll me. Again, the never given spirit kicked in and I scouted around abroad and found a Canadian group called Peak Freaks who said they have a program where we can come to Nepal, train with them and that's called the Triple Crown Expedition. And while we climb these three peaks in the range of approximately 18, 19 and 20,000 feet, we can, they will teach us everything that we need to know about rock climbing, ice climbing, crevice crossing, crevice rescues, etc. And only after successfully going through this program with them, did they invite me back for a bid at the summit. He is Tim Ripple. He's teaching me and teaching our group how to use the Gamoff bag. Now this Gamoff bag can be wrapped up into something like a laptop bag and we carry it with us on the mountains. On the mountains, if anyone gets acute mountain sickness, the only treatment for that is rapid descent. Many times that's not possible because of the weather conditions. So you open this up, put the sick climber into this and it simulates a descent of approximately five to 6,000 feet and helps you buy time to get the sick climber off the mountain. I come back to Mumbai, not the ideal playing ground for somebody who wants to summit Mount Everest. And I started getting a little nervous. I mean, how do you practice for this? How do you shape up for this? And I was lucky to find this high altitude gymnasium in Mumbai. So for an hour every day, I would go into this chamber. It simulated an altitude of 10 to 12,000 feet and it had all this equipment in it. So for an hour every day, I would go in and train myself so that before I actually get onto the mountains, I'm already acclimatized to 10,000 feet. Our team of five members was literally an international team from five continents. The first member of my team was Sean Mooney from Canada. Now, Sean Mooney was the Canadian chess boxing champion. Never heard of that sport before. Apparently you box in the ring and when you're supposed to go to your two quarters to rest, a chess board is brought into the center of the ring. You play chess for four minutes and you start boxing once again. Supposedly the ultimate mental and physical endurance game. The next member in our group was Kevin Fairbrother from Australia. Kevin had successfully summited Mount Everest earlier, but this time he was attempting to summit the mountain without oxygen. So far in the world, less than 100 people have done that. Unfortunately, on the last day below the summit, he just got too breathless. He put on his oxygen and did the summit with oxygen, and it became his second successful summit. The youngest member of our team was Patrick from Ireland, 24 years old, thin, wiry guy, a vegan. The Nepali Sherpas found it extremely difficult. What do you feed this guy on the mountains? So they gave him powder. They used to say, put sugar, put water, mix this and have this. And towards the end of the trip, they told him this is called champa. And this is what they feed the bulls and the yaks on the mountains with. But mentally very strong. Once when we were climbing at 20,000 feet, our team leader got a message on his satellite phone telling us that Patrick's eldest brother had died in an avalanche in the United States. We thought that's the end of his trip. He's going to go back, but he was very practical about it. He said it's going to take at least five days to get back to the United States, by which time the formalities will be over. So he said he will continue climbing and do the summit in honor of his dead brother, truly a never given spirit. The eldest in the group, the only doctor was myself and the only Indian in the group. And the last person in our group is Lee Denhon, who was climbing for the HIV children of South Africa. Because of that, we had a lot of media hype behind our team and we were filmed all the way up to Everest Base Camp 
And once a week, we were shown on TV in uh, South Africa and people were phoning in and pledging in fun funds for the people of HIV in South Africa. Now, when you want to get to Everest from Kathmandu, you take a flight to a place called Lukla. Lukla is situated at 9,000 feet. It is considered the scariest airport in the world because you can see as that spot of plane come in, at one end is a huge valley and at the other end is this big mountain where we are filming it from. So this pilot has one attempt at a proper landing or a proper takeoff. A very exciting flight to be on because you come in low in the valley with these huge mountains and suddenly you see this thin strip of uh, uh, airstrip and you just hope that your pilot is good enough to do a good safe landing. This airport is not open throughout the day. It's open just for a few hours when there are no clouds, when the winds are down. So it's uh, all the planes sort of come in together. They quickly uh, sort of throw out the passengers. The next passengers come in and the plane takes off again. They don't want to be stuck at Lukla. You can see that the passengers will be standing there on the side of the tarmac over there. You can see them against the wall of that building. And as this plane comes in here, the passengers inside jump out, the passengers outside jump in, and this plane takes off again. Now this aircraft is going to the runway to take off, but he stops because there is another aircraft coming into land. And see the walls that these two planes do. One sort of goes out, gives way for the other to go in, and then this plane takes off. A very exciting place for us to just stand here and watch these planes come in and go out. Uh, it's a lovely, pretty sight to see that. All the equipment, everything that you need for your climb comes in on these planes. And that's how we get everything up to Everest Base Camp to make our summit bid. Now you can see this plane as it takes off, you'll realize that this runway is not actually a flat runway, but it is sloping. Now that is the slope in the runway, but a fantastic flight. If you all guys don't want to do Mount Everest, at least do this flight in and out of Lukla it's a beautiful flight and a lovely experience. So we get to look up and it's a totally different world. No more roads, no more vehicles, and everything that you need for your climb goes in on the back of these yaks or the Nepali porters. The Nepali porters, phenomenally strong people carrying these massive loads and still they walk two to three times faster than you can walk. From Everest base, sorry, from 9,000 feet at Lukla, you need to get to Everest base camp at 17,000 feet. You take it easy as you go up, the dictum being not to ascend more than 1,000 feet in a day or in your over enthusiasm. If you do that, you'll get acute mountain sickness and that's the end of your trip. So you go in slowly. It takes approximately a week to reach Everest Base Camp. Some of the visuals along the way, a lot of prayer stones, the temples, the prayer wheels, the Tibetan prayer wheel. Very important. Whenever we go to a new country or a foreign place, we respect the local custom, we respect the local people. So whenever we see this prayer wheels, we keep it on our right, move it in a clockwise direction, and our prayers go up to the heavens. Initially, a lot of forest area, but as we enter the Sagarmatha National Park region, it is replaced by rock, snow, and, and ice. At a place called Dingboshe, the highest spiritual leader of Nepal, Lama Geshi, he resides over there and he did a special puja for us for a safe onward journey up the mountains. The person with the green haversack is me and the one with the blue haversack is Lee. Way ahead, you can see two peaks. The one on the left is Mount Everest and the one on the right is Mount Nupse. A lovely blue clear day. You think this is a perfect day to summit Mount Everest but you can see the plume coming off the mountains at the peak. That shows that the jet, the jet streams are there, very strong winds at the summit, and today is not a day you would be able to summit Mount Everest. Before we get to Everest Base Camp, we come to a place called Monument Hill. Our team leader made us sit down there. He tells us you're getting into serious business. Death is a reality on this mountain. If you want to turn back, this is a safe time to turn back because every stone pile that you see over there is called a chorten and it represents a climber who's lost his or her life while attempting to summit this mountain. And then you reach Everest Base Camp at 17,600 feet. 
This entire village of tents comes up only during the climbing season. And we are all pitched up our tents on this glacier. This entire area is a glacier and we are ringed by these huge mountains. A lovely experience, a unique experience to sleep on a glacier. That yellow tent in the foreground was mine. I'm sleeping there today. When I get up next morning, my tent has shifted somewhere else. I'm sleeping in my tent. Once I suddenly heard water gushing under my tent. I rushed out to the Sherpa and I said, there's water under my tent. He said, obviously, it's a glacier. Go back to sleep. So something very unique for us city slickers, but very common for the people on the mountains. Temperatures anywhere from minus 30 to plus 20. You suddenly get these huge rock formations, ice formations in front of your tent. And in a few hours time, they disappear. Another thing we have always heard, world's highest garbage dump, Mount Everest. Yes, in the past, a lot of garbage, a lot of oxygen cylinders, etc., were dumped over there. But then we realize the ecological damage that's happening on the mountains, especially the Himalayas. And the Nepal government has taken this seriously. So they have sent all the Sherpas, including the Indian Army, has helped to get all this garbage off the mountains. And now it is again back to being a clean mountain. And they take it so seriously that we actually give a garbage deposit to the Nepal government before we climb. And this lady was the campsite inspector who comes in and confirms that all the garbage, all the refuse, including human waste, oxygen cylinders, everything is taken off the mountains. And only then do we get back our garbage deposit. This is our dining tent, a warm place in this cold. And this is going to be home for us for the next six weeks. And you can see a lot of high energy food stuff, high energy drink on the table because we are expected to keep ourselves well hydrated and we eat a lot over there. And thanks again to the Nepali cooks, fantastic food, including on special occasions, they gave us sizzlers. Now, before we actually start our climb, a Tibetan monk comes and does a puja. This is a very revered ceremony done at base camp. This is seeking permission of Sagar Mata Chomur Mulungma, the mountain, for us to step onto her. And only after this puja do we actually step onto the mountain and start our climb of Mount Everest. The one on the left is Mount Everest. The one on the right is Mount Nupse at sunset from a place called Kalapathar. I shall show you in 3D animation what's the route we take up to the summit and then show the actual visuals. The most dangerous part of your climb is actually the first part from Everest Base Camp up to Camp 1, because you have to cross something called the Khumbu Ice Fall. This Khumbu Ice Fall are towering blocks of ice, two, three, four, five, six stories tall, that are coming off the mountains. It's a moving structure. You have a lot of ladder crossings, a lot of crevice crossings. You get across this dangerous segment, get to Camp 1, spend a night at Camp 1, and again come all the way back to Base Camp. You start the whole process again cross the Kumbu Ice Fall, get to Camp 1, spend a night at Camp 1, and now you proceed to Camp 2. Camp 1 to Camp 2, a lovely flat area. You think it's a nice walk in the park, but you're already at 20,000 feet. At 20,000 feet, the oxygen level over there is just 50% that at sea level. The other thing is that we always start our climb early morning around 4 or 5 a.m. when it's extremely cold, so we have all our layers on us. But as the sun comes up, it heat, hits the snow from all the sides and hits you and your body temperature starts rising. The problem is that the moment the sun goes behind a cloud, the temperatures plummet and the sweat on your body turns to ice. You can't allow that to happen. So you keep removing your layers, putting on your layers, get to camp two, spend a night over there, come back all the way down to base camp. You start this whole process again, camp one, one night, camp two, one night, and now you go towards camp three. Camp two to camp three is again an extremely difficult segment. Trust me, because you've got this huge vertical climb that you have to do on solid blue ice. You can't, uh, you're totally exposed to the elements on the solid blue ice. It takes approximately seven, eight hours to reach camp three on the side of the mountain. It's extremely dangerous. You somehow get there and I was really exhausted. And again, seriously, it was the never given spirit that just kept me going. And I thought back to my patients, I'm a cancer surgeon. What about my patients, however bad they are, however painful the disease is, they just cannot give up. They have to keep fighting. That gave me strength. I continued climbing and I crossed camp three. And then you go to camp four. 
Camp 4, again, extremely scary because you get into something called the death zone. You are at 26,000 feet. Man is not supposed to be living at this altitude. At 26,000 feet, your muscles are slowly dying. So you put on your oxygen, you try to live it, stay there as less time as possible. In the evening, you start climbing. You have to continuously climb. You can't stop anywhere. You'll get either frostbite or you'll be blown off the mountain. You continuously climb throughout the night, hoping to reach the summit sometime in the morning, spend a few moments at the summit, and again, come back to the safety of uh, camp four. So the last day, it's going to be a continuous 20 to 24 hours of climbing if you want to successfully do the summit. This is how it looks like when we start walking early morning, each climber with his or her own headlight, a very pretty sight to see. And this is me with the actual Kumbu icefall. I'm just a speck in front of this dark nature at its rawest best. And this is standing at the beginning of the Kumbu icefall. The mountain behind me is Mount Pumori. It is considered the daughter mountain of Mount Everest. And the boots I'm wearing are the Everest boots, very specialized boots costing approximately 50,000 rupees themselves. We carry something called the spot device with us so that back home family and friends can follow me on the mountains and know exactly on the mountain where I am. So I can't say I'm climbing Mount Everest and run away to Bangkok for a month. My wife will know that immediately. We also have this red button, if you can see the SOS button. So in case you are in trouble, you press the SOS button and depending on where you are on the mountain and the weather conditions, they try to send in a rescue uh, helicopter for you. Now this is during the training climb, not the Mount Everest climb, but the training climb. Exactly at this point, the climber behind me slipped and she fractured her ankle. I strapped her fractured ankle onto the normal leg. We pressed the SOS button and within about four hours time, we had this helicopter come in to rescue her. We put her into the helicopter. She was evacuated to Kathmandu and the same day she got her ankle repaired. Now coming back to the Everest climb, this is at the Kumbu Icefall, a very exciting segment, but I just cannot sit down here and take a selfie. At any point of time, that whole thing is going to collapse on me. So the Sherpas make sure they keep pushing you and say, get across it fast, get across it fast. It's not a safe segment to be on. Whenever you see a helicopter going beyond base camp, you can see one just now in the sky, it is going for a rescue mission. This is another time we photographed the rescue mission, the helicopter, and I don't know whether you all can see the injured climber. That is the injured climber. So many times the helicopter cannot land. So you, they throw down a rope, and as a sling operation, the injured climber is brought off the mountain to base camp, then put into the helicopter and evacuated to Kathmandu. This segment is called the popcorn segment. I submitted in 2013 and in 2014, exactly at this spot, 16 Sherpas lost their lives on an avalanche. And because of that, that year, the entire climbing season was abandoned. Here I'm doing a crevice crossing and the person standing behind me is Mingmar, my personal shared path. It is impossible for commercial amateurs like us to successfully summit this mountain without the guidance of the shared path. He's always there with me, guiding me, encouraging me. And here he's encouraging me to do this long segment crossing over here. This, So he's always there by my side, helping me and telling me where and when to climb. And more importantly, when not to climb. This is a video of the uh, Kumbu icefall and the crevice crossing. Look at this crevice. Sometimes you see the bottom, sometimes you don't see the bottom. It didn't matter, I was scared either ways. And many times, even though we are climbing up, we have to climb down, find a safer segment and then get across it and find a better way to climb up. And it's extremely frustrating. Look at this, there's supposed to be a ladder over here, but because of the snow conditions, you can't even see the rungs. So it's very difficult. And why it's so frustrating is every time you take a step down, you know you have to climb back up again. And at that altitude, it's very sort of frustrating and irritating. But that's the only way to do it. Now, I shall show you another crevice crossing. And depending upon the breadth or the length of the crevice, the Sherpas type one, two, or three ladders and throw it across. And this is how you do the crevice crossing. Trust me, it is scary. These things are moving structures, but somehow that's the only way to get across it. We have blind faith in our Sherpas. If he tells me, follow this rope and go across, I will do it. 
And this route, however exciting it is, it keeps changing on a day-to-day -day basis. I might go up this way, but when I come down, this segment would have collapsed and I'll have to find another safer way around it. And again, blind faith in our Sherpas, and he always finds a safe route for us and helps us get up or down from camp one to base camp. So extremely exciting segment, very dangerous. Initially, it took me about eight hours, 10 hours to get across the segment. But as we do it often during the climbing season, we get more adept at it and we can do it much faster. So I cross the Kumbu Icefall and come to camp one. This is camp one, our tents over there at 19,500 feet. And from now onwards, no Sherpa is going to cook for you. You carry on stove, you carry on utensils, and now I'm back to Maggie noodles. The first time we went to this camp one, we got caught in a blizzard. Extremely scary, trust me. You spread eagle yourself out in your tent, you're alone in your tent. You can't speak to the person in the other tent because of the howling winds. Time doesn't pass by. You keep scooping up snow, warming it, and keeping yourself uh, well hydrated. You fall asleep, you get up thinking 10 minutes have passed, you look at your watch. I mean, you think sort of one hour has passed, you look at your watch, just 10 minutes have passed. So time doesn't go, and you don't know how long this blizzard is going to last. I sort of started singing the school hymns, doing anything to keep myself occupied. But luckily, after two days in this blizzard, it cleared up to a clear sky, and we could get back to base camp. This is how it is in a blizzard. You dare not step out. It's just too dangerous. We always carry two bottles with us, the Nalgene bottle in which we carry fluid and the pee bottle, which is the pee bottle. As I said, it's too dangerous to step out at night for a pee. So you pee in this bottle, open the zipper of your tent a little, empty it out, keep it ready for the next episode. Unfortunately, the first time I did that, I did not know I was supposed to empty the bottle. So the next time I got up to use my pee bottle, it was frozen and I couldn't use it. This is coming to camp two at 21,000 feet. You can see a helicopter there. Now this is the highest level at which a helicopter rescue can happen. Once you go beyond this point, helicopters cannot rescue you. So you have to come down to base uh, camp two and then hope for a helicopter rescue. And now we go towards the Lotse phase, which I said is the extremely difficult segment. The person in yellow is me. And here we start climbing the Lotse phase. Solid blue ice. You can see the crampons on my shoes. That's the spikes on my shoes. They do not even sink in. So you have to keep kicking, kicking, get a niche, get your grip, and then take the next step and keep doing this for seven to eight hours and climbing up towards camp three. The four of us here, the fifth one taking the photograph, you can see some climbers way down there going higher into the mountains, crossing something called the Z band on the mountain above the clouds and you reach camp three. Camp three is a ledge dug into the side of the mountain. Just we'll be three people per tent now. So you can see two tents over there. Again, you can see the snow swirling around. You're totally exposed to the elements. And this is at 24,000 feet. You can see a climber has removed his socks. At the, when you reach your destination at the end of the day, you have to take care of the little details. Remove your socks, clean the sweat between your toes, otherwise that will turn to uh, ice and you'll get frostbite. And there's a saying on the mountains, it's never the mountain that kills you, it is the pebble in your shoes. So take care of the little nitty gritties and the entire picture will fall into place. So the entire month of April goes in this up, down, up, down, acclimatizing yourself because that's the only way your body acclimatizes to the low oxygen levels. And we've got our weather inputs that told us that the summit window would be anywhere between May 18th to May 24th that year. So our team leader chose May 19th as the summit day. So we go back out of base camp where the signal area, we call up home and tell them that this is the main summit push we are going for. Now we will go directly base camp, camp one, two, three, four, hit the summit and come back down to base camp. This is climbing towards the summit, that's the summit, and we are reaching uh, camp four over here. Again, a very pretty sight, but extremely windy at this segment. You can see a lovely rainbow over there. And we reached camp four on May 17th evening. This was our group named Peak Freaks at 26,000 feet. You put on your oxygen. As I told you, you are in the death zone now. Your body is slowly dying. That is the summit from my tent. 
And here I've gone to take a dump. Now it's important, nothing freezes. I mean, everything freezes there, so nothing decomposes. So even if you shit there, you have to pick up your shit in a doggy bag, bring it down to camp two or base camp, put it into the dump so it's taken off the mountains. Otherwise, this would be called the world's highest shit pot probably. We sleep with oxygen, and these are very specialized oxygen cylinders that you can see. And on the last day, when you do your summit push, you carry only two oxygen cylinders, one or two bars of chocolates, a water bottle, and a camera. Nothing else. You want to be as light as possible, and you cannot stop anywhere and camp anywhere. Here, Mingmar is checking my oxygen before we set out. We set out on May 18th at 7 o'clock. It was minus 36 degrees, extremely cold. At 7.30, I was exhausted. I just didn't know how I was going to climb the entire night. And this is where teamwork comes in. Each one pushing the other. Come on, one more step, one more step. Ringing in my mind, never given, never given. You can see a lot of people had chosen the same day. And that's why for the summit. And that's why a lot of people leaving camp four together. At 9.30 a.m., uh, sorry, p.m., or around 9, 9.30 p.m., my headlight packed up. The first person in this photograph is uh, my Sherpa, Mingmar. The second person in the yellow is me, and the third is Lee. Again, thanks so much to my teammates and the teamwork. I did not have light, but they threw light and helped me all along the night. You do not need light so much to see where to put your foot. You need the light to change the Jumar or the ascender from one line to the other line safely, lock it, and continue climbing. You're wearing your gloves, you're wearing your mitts, and it's very clumsy to do that. And with the light, it helps. So the entire night, you keep climbing, keep climbing. I was sort of beyond exhaustion. And the only time you stop is at the place called the balcony, where you leave your old oxygen cylinder there, put on a fresh oxygen cylinder, eat one or two bars of chocolate, hydrate yourself, and continue climbing the night. This is the early morning view near the summit. It sort of enthuses you because you know that the bulk of your climb is below you. And you, for a change, you actually see the sun rising from below you and coming up into the horizon. It warms you up. It sort of gives you more strength. And you decide that you continue climbing. What a perfect day. Not a cloud in the sky, hardly any wind. It was a perfect day to summit Mount Everest. I'm not ashamed to say, when I came to segments like this, rocky segments, I was so exhausted, I would literally be crawling across it then again stand up and continue climbing on the IC segment. We were very lucky. We saw something called the pyramid or the shadow. This is the shadow of Mount Everest on the Nepal Valley at sunrise on a clear day. A very pretty sight to see, and we were lucky to capture it on camera. So we keep climbing towards the summit. And even so late, after so many hours of climbing, I cannot see the summit of Mount Everest. I am seeing something called the South Summit. And this is the South Summit. And only when you reach here, that way above over there, you see the actual summit of Mount Everest. That is me coming onto the South Summit. And now we have only two obstacles remaining. The first is called the ridge. This ridge is a very narrow segment. I was extremely nervous at this point because you have to get across this narrow segment to the left of the segment is the Nepal Valley, and to the right is the China Valley. To make matters worse, climbers are crisscrossing. So one of you has to unhook from this line, get across the climber, and then hook back onto your line. I was extremely nervous. I shouted out to the Sherpa, and I said, if I slip, should I slip to the left or to the right? He shouted back, fall to the right, fall to the right. When I came back down, I asked him, why did you tell me to fall to the right? He said, you would live longer. The fall to the left, is 8,000 feet. The fall to the right is 12,000 feet. Anyways, I did manage to get across this nerve wracking segment. And then we have the last obstacle, which is the uh, Hillary step. Now, this Hillary step is of approximately 40 feet at 29,000 feet. And you have to haul yourself up, straddle it, and get across to the other side. It is just 40 feet, but it took me more than 20 minutes to haul myself up this, straddle it, and get across to the other side. And when you get across to the other side, you see the summit in front of you, and you know that you can hit the summit, and you're going to achieve your goal.
At 9.10 a.m. on May 19, 2013, I had the privilege of standing on the summit of Mount Everest with the Lawrence flag. You have to remove your goggles, you have to remove your helmet, you have to remove your oxygen, photograph yourself on the summit, otherwise the Nepal government does not acknowledge that you reached the summit, and you have to get back down. The weather changes in a jiffy, it is playing on your mind that most of the deaths on Mount Everest happen on the way down, not on the way up, and you've got limited oxygen supply. So you can see here, when I was coming up, it was perfectly clear, but as I'm going down, it's so cloudy, I have to get through these clouds and reach the safety of Camp 4. If anyone dies on Mount Everest above 26,000 feet, the bodies remain there. Depending upon the weather conditions and the snow conditions, you sometimes see them, you sometimes they are covered. This was a Japanese climber who had died a few years earlier, and it's a stark reminder of the danger you are in. You just say a silent prayer and you continue quickly down. I reached back Camp 4 at 6 o'clock the next evening, extremely exhausted, crawled into my tent, early next morning, got up fast, sort of went across Camp 3, came back to Camp 2, and that's when I had a nice hot cup of tea and rested out at Camp 2. Next day, you get up early, go across Camp 1, and you reach base camp. And it's only when you reach base camp that you allow the celebrations to start that you have successfully summited Mount Everest. But as we were celebrating there, we were told that a storm is coming in, so to take a helicopter ride and get out as fast as possible. So we got this helicopter in. Now, again, it's very sort of, uh, you can, it's a very lovely helicopter ride from 18,000 feet, 17,000 base camp down to the Kathmandu Valley. But you cannot do it from Kathmandu up to 17,000 feet or you'll get acute mountain sickness. So we got this helicopter in. Here, I'm hugging my team leader for a once in a lifetime experience, getting into the helicopter. And it's a very lovely uh, sort of ride that you can do. Here, I'm taking off from base camp. And this helicopter pilot will now follow the glacier, stay low in the valley and come out. And you can see us here, we're sort of following this glacier out of the mountains and lower and lower down. We were doing this because we were trying to get out of the uh, out of the clouds, but you can see that the clouds were ahead. This helicopter as low as possible in the valley, and I started getting sort of little jittery over here, thinking that oh god, this is not how it's supposed to end, because we are so low. I could see clouds ahead. I knew there was a storm ahead, and I was just praying that I would safely reach back to Kathmandu. You can see the sort of over here. We are so close to the side of the mountain and coming lower and lower. Unfortunately, we went into a white cloud. We had to land on a field over there and we waited, but the clouds did not clear. We spent the night at this field. It was next morning that we got up to a clear sky again, got back into the helicopter, reached Kathmandu, where I had a lovely hot bath and a lovely warm bed to sleep on after almost six to seven weeks. So fellow Laurentians, if there is a message in this talk, it is to dream big. Dream big and take that first step. Because when you stand on the summit of your Everest, whatever it may be, it is not the mountain that you would have conquered, but yourself. Thank you, never given. Professor Adrian. Murad. Yes, sir. That was absolutely fabulous. Thank you. That was absolutely fabulous. And, and, and this is not just my personal emotion. This is the emotional of every Laurentian, whether we saw this or whether we know of this. Uh, the Nepal government requires you to take off your goggles and take a picture to acknowledge that you have climbed Mount Everest. And Murad, we Laurentians acknowledge that you are one of a kind Laurentian. We are proud to be Laurentians also because of you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. That was fabulous. Now, you know, I've been looking at the Q&As and uh, I, I, I see a question here. Yes. Uh, uh, and it says, it's from Central. 
And Sentinel says, Murad, you are such a calm and gentle person. How has Everest impacted you, changed your life, changed your perceptions? Yeah, Sentinel, uh, yeah, Sentinel is my classmate, by the way, and we are very good friends. In a way, it makes you more spiritual. More spiritual, not in the religious sort of kind of way, but one gets a better appreciation towards life. You know, we, uh, everything else just turns so petty and you come back and you read the newspapers and say, oh God, these people are fighting about this. You know, just send them on an experience like this and your entire horizons sort of broaden up. So I think in a way you become more spiritual and that's what has changed from me coming back from Everest. Murad, uh, now you, you have been a cancer surgeon uh, for the last 20 years. That's and, right. and in, uh, in your narration, uh, I, I, I may not recall the exact words, but in your narration, you said uh, that climbing Everest and the difficulties that it presented to you brought out the never given spirit in you and you connected that to your cancer patients. True. And you said that mine was a journey up the mountain. Theirs is a journey in life. Very true. So, so is a cancer journey a difficult journey when you compare it to the things that you have witnessed? Uh, both very challenging, but let me put it this way. The mountain for me was a one-off challenge. As a cancer surgeon, literally every case that I operate upon is a challenge. And it, I think it would be put into perspective if I put it this way. On the mountain, it was my life on the line. But in cancer surgery, it is my patient's life on the line. So obviously that has so much responsibility for me. And from the patient's point of view, as I said, this mountain, I was doing it just for the heck of it. If it got too uncomfortable, if I felt way out of my depth, I just turn back and come back to the comfort of my home. But for a cancer patient, there is no turning back. However bad the disease may be, however painful, however horrible the treatment might be, he has only one way to go and that is forward. So definitely it is so different in many ways and so similar in many ways. Uh in a more in a in a more practical way murad yes uh, you know we all we all uh, uh, try and earn money uh, in order to survive through life and uh, and you have i would imagine have spent a lot of money in your your various adventures but but i'm talking specifically about everest true and I want to ask you a question, two questions. Yes. Question one, if you don't mind answering, how much did it cost? And question two, if it cost a lot, was it worth it? Yes, question one, how much did it cost me? In 2013, because I went with one of the cheaper groups, it costed me 35 lakh rupees for my trip because the permit from the Nepal government to even attempt summiting Mount Everest costs 10 lakh rupees. That is their main source of income for them. So it's a very expensive proposition. Today, one of the cheaper groups would be anyways between 50 to 60 lakhs if you go with the same group that I went in. And it goes anywhere up to a crore. So was it worth it? Definitely it was worth it. I put it into perspective. I would not buy a BMW car. I would rather go for this experience. And I would rather go to the grave with a bank full of memories rather than a bank full of money. So definitely it was worth it. And I had no hesitation in spending that money. Oh, that was so profoundly put. Murad, you are not only an adventurer, but you're also a poet. I mean, <laughs> can you imagine? Your, your statement was that I would rather go to the grave with a bank full of memories than a bank full of money. 
That is fabulous. And, and nothing could be more inspiring or appropriate to tell our young Laurentians. Nothing could be more inspiring than, than, than to have a memory bank. Uh, but again, to be a little practical, I, I, I'm again going to ask you two questions. Yes. Question one, what did your family say? I know that your wife uh, is a doctor and I do know that she also, uh, she was also probably the more important, important person in your Himalayan car rallies because, you know, with our wives, we, we are quite directionless most of the time. So I'm sure that was, uh, she was the reason for your success in many ways. But the two questions I have to ask. One, what did she say when you suggested that you wanted to climb Everest? That is question one. And question two, what did she say after you climbed Everest? What did she say when I decided that I wanted to climb Everest and I told her I want to climb Everest was, I want to come as well. Oh! <laughs> But then it was the practicality of it. And we had to sort of put things into perspective. We have two lovely kids. So we decided that we do these uh, things one at a time. My wife has spent six months in Antarctica as the uh, medical expedition doctor for the Indian team to uh, Antarctica. So she was there for six months. So she's also got this adventure spirit. And when I did the Himalayan car rally, she's the navigator for me. So yes, I mean, Every success is because of family. You can't do these sort of adventures if you don't have the solid backing of your family. My father, who was 87 years at that point of time, I remember he came from Hyderabad to Bombay and he took me aside and said, Murad, I'm 87. And if anything happens to me, do not turn back. Continue your climb. So when you have such a family behind you, such family backing behind you, then you're blessed. So yes, you definitely require a family backing. Uh, you know, Murad, uh, even while I'm uh, at this moment in the Middle East, in the UAE, home for me is Hyderabad. Oh, is it? Now, now, as soon as our airports open up, I'm going on a pilgrimage back to Hyderabad, and I promise you, I'm going to drop in and see your father. Uh, I really am. <laughs> I really am. Unfortunately... Uh, my father expired just last month. Oh, uh, oh. Yeah, at, at the age of 92, but his memory lives on. And even my future endeavors and ex, uh, sort of expeditions is all going to be in his honor. And of course, my mom who's still around and always there behind me. So family backing is most important, but thank you. Yes, I'm happy to know that you also from Hyderabad. <laughs> yes, and you know, Murad, uh, 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 like you, I have children and I have grandchildren. Uh, well, you don't have grandchildren, but I have children and grandchildren. And I want you to know that, that you know, what you have done uh, uh, makes, made your father very proud. Uh, but what you have done also makes your children so proud. Thank you. It makes your children so proud. It makes your children so proud. I, 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 and your wife, uh, having been in the Antarctica and having been with you in the Himalayan rallies, you make an absolutely great family. And you know, if, if at all we could have a, a, a group of families uh, that we would like to say that these are the first families of our Laurentians, you, you can tell the children from me that you will very likely figure in that first family of Laurentians. Thank okay, you. Murad. Now, Murad, on my behalf, uh, and on behalf of OL Nation, uh, and on behalf of the entire community of thousands of Laurentians who have been through the dear old school, I want to tell you how proud we are of you. Congratulations and well done. Thank you, thank you, Professor. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Arjun, over to you. Oh, that was a wonderful session and very well moderated. I don't know. I used to think that sunsets and sunrises at sea were beautiful, but the pictures you shared with us 
Well, absolutely, as the younger generation say, awesome. And I'm sure, like me, many others who are watching this presentation uh, had their hearts racing, and some of us are senior citizens, uh, palpitations happening. I think we, really, we lived that entire trip with you. I don't need to summit it anymore, but I don't need to have to summit it. But you've taken us on a fabulous trip, and I feel I've really done, uh, you, you've done wonders. I've seen the comments coming up. Everybody just loved it. Thank you so much, Murad and Adrian. I think, uh, like you, you said everything about Murad, and I think that particular part where he said, I'd rather have a bag full of memories rather than a bag full of money is the clinching factor with his never given motto. And, and you might have noticed I've changed my background to the school crest just for this because of this inspiration that Murad has done for me. Thank you very much. I'm waiting for Rohan to come back on and uh, I can hand it over to him so that he can take us forward in the, the, the remainder part of our uh, program from now. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you, Dr. Murad. Thank you. So, Rowan, before, over before, to you. Before, before we thank you, thank you so much, uh, Captain. And before uh, I let Murad and Adrian go, I just got a message that it's Murad's birthday. No, yesterday. Oh, oh well, yeah, well, yeah. Belated happy birthday, Murad. So I think uh, it's a great uh, way to uh, wish you. Uh, thank you so much again, Adrian and Murad, for joining us. And now um, I'm going to uh, hand over to, we are, we, are, we are approaching the end of our session, but uh, I can see a lot of messages on the chat about what's next. Uh, and one of my messages uh, in response has been, uh, we like to set the bar high so that there's something we can always aspire to. And I think, uh, you know, uh, there's so many of us behind this uh, session. Uh, I'm just, uh, you know, I'm the messenger, you know. Uh, I want to thank everybody. I mean, it's Arjun, it's Atul, it's Sachin, it's Bina, it's the Johnny from the OLA. Uh, I mean, so many, all of you guys as well. We worked so hard together and it feels good that we finally got the show on the road. It's only a start. And to get uh, things going, what we're going to do is we're going to, and, and, and each, uh, each session with a teaser, something to, uh, to look forward to the next time around. And I'm just getting our next, I have one more speaker. I can't find him. Oh yeah, here, here he is. So I'd li like to uh, introduce you to Dr. Dinesh Arab. Uh, Dinesh is a Sumeru 89, and um, he's an interventional cardiologist. So he's a chief of staff at, at the Advent Health Medical Center at Daytona Beach in Florida. Uh, I think he's had many, many years starting out as an intern. That's why I kept you guys online at Ospania General Hospital in Hyderabad. So uh, Dinesh has an affinity or OLs have an affinity for Dinesh. Uh, there's a very specific reason for that. And before me, before me, you know, before I spill the beans, I'm going to hand, hand, hand you over to Dinesh. Dinesh, go ahead. Well, uh, thank you, Rohan. You know, uh, I always get this graveyard shift where uh, you know, everybody, <laughs> it's like almost I get on the Titanic and everybody wants to leave. Um, so I'll tell you a quick story about my first experience on this graveyard shift. So I just finished my uh, fellowship and uh, became an attending finally, and that's 13 years in the making. And I get this title of assistant professor. So I'm like walking around with a strut. And so there's this conference going on in Chicago and they say, you know, the university promotes me and they say, you know, we want you to go ahead and give a talk. And uh, they give me some obscure topic because I'm the junior most. But I'm all gung-ho, you know, I've just become an assistant professor. I'm all excited. I prepare the hell out of that topic. I even tell my fellows, I said, listen, if any one of you guys can get me on this topic, um, I'll take you guys out to dinner. And offering dinner to fellows is like, they're like hyenas, they'll do anything for that. Anyway, nobody can get me on that. So the day comes of the presentation, I get ready, I'm all suited, my tie, hair done. I walk into this room to do my presentation and there's one guy there, that's it. And I think he later told me that he just went there to get a nap and get away from everybody. So anyway, I plug my laptop in, the timer goes down, start my spiel, 
I say, I'm going to do this. Even if there's that one guy sitting there, I'm going to try and hold his attention. I do my 10 minute talk and he's trying to get away. I keep trying to make eye contact, keep him in place, but it gets through. And um, we both walk out and he says, hey, you know, that was a pretty cool talk. And he asked me a few questions. We interacted a bit, but it taught me two things. Number one, someone's always listening. And number two, don't take yourself too seriously. So my next uh, segue is towards health. You know, I'm a cardiologist, that's what I, I talk about. And it's about a friend of mine. Um, it's just, I'll give, tell you a story about him and then um, uh, lead you to, and we'll talk about it more during the next session. So for patient confidentiality's sake, we'll call him Vivek. Vivek says, of, um, he's an Indian guy living in the United States. And that'll be part of the segue about the risks we as Indians face for cardiovascular disease. So Vivek's um, mid forties, married, kids, living the American dream. And um, one day he throws his big party and uh, everyone's having a good time. We good food, drink, we're out on the dance floor. And um, Vivek comes next to me and he says, hey, you know, I've been meaning to talk to you. You know, every once in a while I get this little discomfort uh, in my chest. I get this all the time. It's not just on the dance floor. I get it during swimming, during anything. And generally it's, um, and the women always pull a fast one on me, you know, doctor, I got this chest pain. I generally tell them that's not my department. It's my brother's department. I don't deal with that kind of chest pain, but anyway, I digress. So I tell him, you know, come to the office, come on Monday and we'll uh, get you checked out. Monday rolls by, no sign of Vivek. Tuesday, I call him and I say, hey, what, what about what happened about that thing? So, oh, no, I'm busy. I got this meeting. I got that meeting. I was like, just come on down and we'll just check you out. It's probably nothing, but we'll just check it out. Drag him in on Tuesday and we do something called a stress test. Now, a stress test is us just stressing your heart. And then we inject a radionuclide into a vein in your arm. And um, I hope I'm still on. Um, anyway, we, um, we inject a radionuclide in your arm and then take pictures of your heart. So put him on the treadmill. He does great. And he's a bit of an athlete himself, you know, good golfer, good tennis player, and um, does go great on the stress test. I mean, doesn't have any symptoms, but when I look at his scan, there are like three areas in his heart that are not getting enough blood. So I sit him down and I say, you know, Viv, um, you need to do a procedure called a cardiac catheterization or coronary angiogram. And this freaks him out completely. He's like, you're kidding. You know, I'm, I feel fine. This was just this odd discomfort that I'm getting now. And then I said, no, no, it's the real deal. So cardiac catheterization is a procedure where you get into an artery either in your wrist or in your leg, and then you snake up all the way to your heart, take pictures, get into those arteries that supply your heart and take pictures. And I'll show you what it looks like. It's like, dude, I need a second opinion. I'm like, yeah, take your time, get a second opinion. He goes, talks to his family, second opinion, third opinion, get 20 calls. You know, Indian patients are the most difficult patients for me because there are at least five doctors in the family and they don't talk to each other. <laughs> so I get all these calls, beta, what's going on? You know, this, that. And I was like, listen, it's going to be fine. It's just a cardiac catheterization. We'll just take a look, see what we're dealing with. And then we'll take it from there. So after it's like dragging this horse to the water, get him to the cath lab and then we do the procedure and I'm gonna share my screen and I hope to God this works. Uh, and I'll show you what his angiogram looks like. So that's what an angiogram looks like. Um, if you can, these are arteries, these, this is a catheter and that's filling this artery with contrast. And this is what Vivek's artery looked like. And you can see right here, I'll pause that for you. Right here is a critical blockage. It's just hanging by a thread right there. And um, this is what a rest of his artery looks pretty normal. So this is an artery die critical blockage right there. You see that little pinhole going on over there. The rest of the pictures, there it goes again. So these are the same arteries we're looking at in different directions. And this is the third artery and you can see that he's got a critical blockage right here as well, right there. So that fills, that's a critical blockage. 
So here's Vivek hanging on to his life by two little threads and dancing over there and having a good time. And um, we fix it for him. And this is what a fix looks like. Uh, put a catheter in, we get a little wire down and you can see this wire that I've gotten down is about three times the diameter of a human hair. And you can see it's already blocking flow. So it's that tight, his blockage. Open it with a balloon, that's a balloon going up. And uh, then we put a stent in, and that's a stent. A stent is a little mesh tube that we put in all of there and you can see it's already starting to look better. For you physics geeks out there, we take that balloon up to about 20 atmospheres of pressure sometimes and one atmosphere of pressure is about 760 millimeters of mercury. So you're talking about 15,000 millimeters of mercury of pressure to open that artery. And there it's starting to look much better. Take some more pictures, touch it up a little more. And there's the final result. Now then we go to the right, same story, put a wire through, balloon, stent, and voila, it's open. So that was Vivek, you know, living his life, happy as a clam, and hanging on to life by a thread, literally. Vivek was lucky, you know, he happened to, you know, bump into me literally on the dance floor. So I guess the model of the story is if you're gonna have a dance party, make sure you call your cardiologist long. Uh, but a lot of people aren't so lucky. We have people who die in the field all the time. And the, the most common comment that I get is, you know, he was doing fine. He wasn't, he was having those weird symptoms. It was not classic, but it was there. And if you don't die in the field, a lot of people come in with a ma massive heart attack, which Vivek would have had and uh, lost a lot of his heart. So do join us for the next uh, uh, you know, session. We're gonna have a bunch of experts, lifestyle experts. We're gonna try and tell you how not to come to the situation. And even if you do come to the situation, we will talk to you about different treatment options, what it would be like to be a patient because an informed patient, in my opinion, is the best patient. So we'll take you through the human body, what causes heart, what causes, I mean, what causes heart attacks, what causes stroke. Um, and we'll teach you about what to do if you become a patient on you know, what questions to ask. And um, hopefully you will join us. Back to you, Rohan. And thank you, Dinesh. Uh, it's really, uh... I mean, it's more than a teaser, actually. I will, what, I, what I would like to hear from you is, uh, you know, this is OL Nation, you know? Uh, so the OLA and I and the rest of the guys, we put this together, uh, specifically targeting the OL Laurentian audience. And one of the things I heard uh, from some of the folks uh, when we were structured, uh, you know, getting the architecture together was that, you know, we meet all these OLs and they like the fire, they like fire water. So what I want you to specifically say out here is how relevant is this topic to our old Laurentian community in your, because I know a lot of the guys call you. Yeah, it, it is very relevant. Um, and um, it's relevant to us as a, as a race. I don't think we, we realize that. I'll tell you that as, a, as um, the Asian race and that, you know, we like to think of okay. ourselves as different uh, Indians, Bangladeshis and uh, Pakistanis. But we form 25% of the world population and we account for about 65% of cardiovascular mortality. Um, we, Ooh. like other things, have got the, literally the short end of the stick. I mean, the Indian coronary anatomy is, is, is just, it's smaller, it's trickier. We have a standing joke saying if an Indian comes in with chest pain, just take him to the lab. He's going to have something. But... Um, at the turn of the century, they did some analysis and they said, you know, the rate of growth of cardiovascular disease in India is gonna be about 45% for men and about 30% for women. This was in around 2000. The numbers just came in a couple of uh, last year and the rate of growth was 140%. Those were the actual numbers for men and 130% for women. So genetically we are all in that same boat uh, we have those kind of risk factors we have that same kind of body type and um, you know there was a senior of mine who actually died in school during founders uh, from a heart attack 
So this is serious stuff. Uh, and um, the sooner you get ahead of it, I think the better off you'll be. So um, it, I would really recommend tuning in for the next session if you're free. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, Dinesh. Uh, and uh, I, I'm very, very sure we'll have much larger attendance. Um, thank you once again. I think you've got to get back to work. Um, so take care and we'll be in touch and we're gonna see you uh, well in the next uh, uh, practice or uh, preparation uh, sessions. And folks, Dinesh has been uh, working with us with the working group for the last couple of weeks to put this together. So thank you very much, Dinesh. Thank you. So, okay, so we are, we, we are done for now, everybody. Uh, thank you again to all our attendees on the Zoom session. Thank you to everyone on Facebook. There are a huge amount of people on Facebook. And um, as you know, we had a, the, a little bit of a glitch with YouTube. I promise you we'll set it all right uh, in time for the, now, for the next session, which is basically scheduled for the fourth Saturday of July. I think that's the 25th. We'll keep you posted on the content. Uh, uh, just some housekeeping things. Uh, you know, we have a working group uh, of uh, specialist uh, all Laurentians with a whole, whole lot of expertise. So we work together day and night to put this together. Uh, we also have the OLA who's working uh, separately and with us. So we work as one big family to get something uh, of value to all our all Laurentian families. Uh, separately on some minor housekeeping notes, I've been approached by a lot of people uh, to volunteer. You know, we want suggestions, we want ideas, and please come forward. There's no need to be shy, it's just the OL family. Uh, women, of course, you know, I've been getting a bit of grief from the girls, but uh, you know, uh, there's no such thing. This is not an exclusive male only thing. Come forward, ladies. We want to hear from you. We want you to share your life experience with the rest of the OL community. Um, that's all for now. Uh, I wish you a great weekend. God bless you. Bye-bye. Rohan Sherry, Vindya, 86, signing off. <laughs>